a special message from this month's presenting sponsor. Learn about Baltimore's rich industrial legacy through working galleries that explore the history of the Bethlehem steel mill, an antique print shop, a garment loft, and more at the Baltimore Museum of Industry, the BMI. Hours and information at thebmi.org. Also, use the code TRUTH50, that is TRUTH50, my special code, and get 50% off of admission at the front desk or use it when purchasing the tickets online. So please visit thebmi.org and make that trip today. And welcome to The Truth In This Art. I am your host, Rob Lee. And today I have the privilege of being in conversation with a Dominican American artist from the pre-gentrified Lower East Side of Manhattan, residing in Baltimore. Her art is a strange and awkward yet beautiful meeting of graffiti, folk art, Caribbean vibes, direct conversations and healing. Please welcome Rosie Sunshine Galvan. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, 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 the privilege is all mine. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> this is this is great. <laughs> I mean, we, were, we were obviously talking a little bit beforehand and I did my I did my full intro actually because I felt like I got to be impressive right now. <laughs> OK, <laughs> then, you know, some Dominicano and everything. <laughs> <laughs> OK, <laughs> look, man, I was listening to Bachata earlier. Don't get me started. OK, because it's a global phenomenon. <laughs> I was going old school. I was listening to like, uh, what is it? Uh, Rollin. Uh, Rodriguez. <laughs> oh, Raulín Rodriguez. What you know about that? Medicina de amor. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's get into the vital stats. Um, so you know, LES. Uh, so you know, give us those vital stats. You know, where did you grow up? That kind of situation, and what were some of those strongest influences you you had growing up? Because um, I think some people have like maybe you know, sometimes maybe odd influences, maybe artistic influences, um, like, you know, was there any movies, artists, cartoons, things of that nature, comics that really kind of were influences for you early? So so give me that a little bit. Yeah, um, like you mentioned, I'm from LES, Lower East Side, um, specifically Cherry Street, take the F train at East Broadway. Uh, so I will say that just growing up in LES period, I had so many influences. It's such a strong immigrant community from folks from Eastern Europe, you know, Orthodox Jewish folks, um, Polish folks, et cetera, Puerto Ricans, Chinese Chinatown is right there. Little Italy is right there. And then you had the freaks walking distance in the village, you know, all the art, the artists from the 80s and 90s and just, you know, being able to go outside and walk around and see like a club kid wearing angel wings and like, I don't know, like <laughs> foot tall platform heels or whatever. Um, so I would say my influences were very much environmental in terms of just being on the subway and looking at people's stories, expression, um, and, you know, just colors, et cetera. And then of course, going back home to um, Dominican Republic, all the different color houses, you know, you have a Pepto-Bismol pink house on that <laughs> corner, a beautiful orange house on the next. So I would just say I just come from communities that really cherish color as a way to express, um, but also take up space. Um, oftentimes growing up in areas where, you know, folks are systematically invisibilized, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's on a colonial context in DR or whether that's, you know, in an urban setting like New York. Um, but I will say more specifically, like to your question around like specific artists, um, Keith Haring was a huge influence for me just growing up in the 80s and 90s and all of his murals and um, all he did for the HIV movement to bring awareness and just the simplicity of his work and the like repetition of the work um having all these different like beings you know they're all different but they are are part of the same spirit um i definitely lean on his influence a lot um yeah thanks for the question it was kind of fun to think about that <laughs> oh, absolutely and it um it definitely is you know as, as much for me as it is for the um the audience it's like you can read, you can look at the work and so on, unless you're hearing it from the person and what's baked into it, um, you you, you kind of lose something, you know what I mean? And so so thank you for sharing that. And um, yeah, Keith Haring, yeah, I have um, some some socks here. Uh, I have a few, I have a few different things around the space. I've, uh, I remember just one time, this is ridiculous and this is, has nothing to do with what you said. However, it's a funny anecdote. I remember getting very, um, 
elevated, if you will, and uh, pulling out one of my art books. And I was like, yeah, man, this is great, man. Here's the thing. I was like, yeah, Keith Haring, hell yeah, man. So this is what I do. Amen. We are on the same wavelength all around. So <laughs> I feel like you could be an Aquarius. Maybe not. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> you know what? I'm like, do I have an Aquarius? It's it's my it's my rising sign. Yes. So there is a dash there. Are you an Aquarius? I'm a cusp Aquarius. Yes. Okay, we'll have to talk about that. Yeah, we'll, we'll sure. discuss. We'll discuss. <laughs> so, you know, reading reading in it, uh, I, I love the strange. I love the awkward. So, and, and just, you know, echoing like graffiti and folk art is a, it's a melting pot in some ways and not in a corny like, oh, your art is urban, but in a legitimate like this is coming together various disciplines and influences. So describe your work for us like and really give us that what your process looks like in in the most like i guess high view kind of terms yeah um my process i would say is channeling channeling like spirit whatever that means for you um i do my best work when i just listen to the ideas as they come so you know not too much planning sometimes sometimes i do have a theme um but sometimes i'm just like what should I do? And it's so odd. And I've heard other artists describe it across mediums. Um, it's just sort of like you, it just comes from somewhere. It's hard to say where that place is. Yeah. Um, and just being led by that. So for some reason, my somewhere um, loves squiggles, loves round circles, loves repetitive patterns, um, bright colors, um, and just using, I guess, movement and dots to just like express happy energy yeah. um, as an antidote to um, oppression and all the things that we often have to survive. Um, just a reminder to center our joy and our liberation. Um, so, yeah, I would say that's how I would describe sort of like my um, technique is really around patterns and colors, repetition, dots, um, squiggles, roundness um and extraness of course <laughs> <laughs> and as i as i look in here now granted this is an audio media but as i'm looking over your shoulders i was like uh-huh that's indicative everything you just described is right there <laughs> Yes, because it's yes. definitely like as a person that has really like yo where are the prints i need shirts like you know like this is where i'm at now and there's one ridiculous shirt that i have and it's like look i gotta break that out when the, when the temperature goes up it's like black with some like orange squiggles and dots throughout. I was like, hell yeah. I got like one shirt where I'm wearing it. I was like, yo, this is this is great. So I gravitate towards that sort of visual. So obviously yeah. that with the, the 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 colors, like as I'm seeing, I definitely um, get a Caribbean vibe off of it in, in terms of the, the choice of colors. And there there's an artist uh, that I, I interviewed a while back, Dominican um, dude named Delvin Lugo. And um, New York based, and I, I, I was I'm seeing very similar colors, and I'm like, look, I love it, I love it. This is what this is, and um, yeah, like this is what it reminds me of. And you know, I know it's weird to compare like people's work and all, but yeah, that's that's the that. vibe I'm getting. Yeah, I love that, and I just wrote, um, what is Delvin? What are Delvin's pronouns? Uh, I think he. Okay, yeah. he is. I'm just manifesting. We're gonna be besties. Uh, we're <laughs> we're gonna meet. I'm like Dominican artist colors say less. Like, <laughs> um, but I yeah. Is it okay if I ask you a question? Spin it. Um, when you mentioned the T-shirt with the squiggles and the dots and stuff, like, what does that do for you? Um, it just like one the 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 fabric for one thing. It makes me feel like okay, I'm really comfortable. I feel like. I'm in like the, the the picture I'm thinking of. I'm in like um, I'm off the high line. I'm in, so I'm in New York. I'm at uh, maybe Artichoke, and I'm just sitting there. And the type of shot that's there, it's like the whole thing. It's like yo, I look like the shit right here. I am on point. I, I'm feeling very tropical as well. I was like, I'm at relaxed, and if I felt, I guess, artsy. So I just felt like, okay, this is my final form. I could wear this all the time. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Cause yeah. I do feel that it does influence your energy, like yeah. your vibration. Um, so that just confirmed that. No, th yeah, I'm happy to share. People rarely ask me anything. I'm like, look, I'm literally sitting right here. I have a conversation. It's not like, yeah, so here's this interrogation. <laughs> you know? Right. Um, 
So could you tell us about your, your current body of work and any inspiration that, that comes in it and how it's like maybe grown or changed from like earlier work? Absolutely. Um, I can speak to that very uh, passionately, actually. I've been thinking about my work quite a bit lately. Um, in the past, for many, many years, my work was really directly centered around healing from, from different types of traumas. Um, like helping me talk through really difficult things that I'd experienced. Um, and now that I've been able to sort of like release that um, through my art, through therapy, through vulnerability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I feel now that my art is transitioning mm -hmm. to instead of centering my trauma, centering our joy and going back to like this antidote to, you know, all the things that get us down. Um, we talk a lot about like, health inequities or, you know, systemic racism, but we don't often hear about the toll that it takes on our mental health mm -hmm. to have to navigate the world in unsafe environments or just constantly feeling under threats or, or not seen. Um, so my work is not transitioning into exploring, you know, what, what, power colors do have like i want to learn more about the vibrational frequency of different shades of different you know etc so um i'm centering more joy in my work and and sort of along those lines um i've been exploring more murals and public art um whereas before i was very like canvas focused mm -hmm. um to connect back to like bringing joy and brightening spaces um, to increase the vibrational energy and frequency of, of neighbors and, and folks around us um, in public spaces versus like having a painting of mine in your home or in a gallery. Yeah, that's that's great. And um, as, you, as you were just describing that, um, and I, and I want to ask you about colors in a moment. Um, but yeah, like going back to your, your question, because I, I ruminated on that's, that's what I do. And the, the other thing about the shirt um, and talking about the squiggles and just the, the colors that are in it, it, it's black and orange. And mm -hmm. there was an Orioles color. So also the Baltimore thing, it's like mm -hmm. I'm wearing a like connection to, I guess, home and, and, and where, yeah. I'm, where I'm from. So that's also kind of baked into that and another observation. Uh, and, and thank you. Thank you. I mean, this is this is going well. Um, uh, <laughs> so so tell me, tell me about like, like, like colors in a macro sort of way, like what they may represent to you. Like I, I, we hear about the Pantone, we hear about the marketing stuff of, you know, we want to look at yellows and oranges and reds for envy and blue for whatever, like being sad or melancholy. But for you, what, what are some colors that come to mind? What do colors to you represent? Are they flourishes? Are they emotions? Tell me about that. Mm, yeah. I love that you named like sort of like the marketing uh research behind this because i think it's something that we could build off of like if we can figure out what colors do to our minds to sell products then what can we figure out for color what colors can do to heal us and to make us feel amazing um so for me colors remind me of growing up in a very like uh intentionally um like a neighborhood that was intentionally not invested in mm and how dreary it felt, you know, and just being in New York, it's dirty, it's dirty even today, as much as they want to gentrify it, it's still disgusting, you know, let's keep it real. <laughs> but back then, you know, I just had this image of just feeling cold and everything around me looking brown and gray and just having those moments where I did walk past a mural or someone's graffiti and it just disrupted whatever yeah. depression or just sadness I was feeling. Um, and I just really remember those moments and and know that that has the same effect today so if i'm outside painting a mural i can see people's moods changing their smiles start to come up they start laughing they yeah. start talking um to me a stranger who they would normally not um talk to so i don't know if that answered your question but when i think about you know the power of colors i think about what i've observed um, colors doing to people's moods around me I and mean, to myself. What's going to happen right. is the the rosy and and Rob like book of like uncolonized colors. I I just feel like that's going to be a thing because yes. I've, I've used the term before and I and I think you were kind of circling around it. Gentrification gray is a thing. Oh my gosh! 
Yes. Is that the color that all the like quick flips paint the walls? <laughs> that, I mean, the house I'm in, my where my studio is at. Yes. And I heard that from um, I was joking with uh, Molly Ricks from Baltimore Heritage. And, you know, one of the things that they do is maintaining, preserving historical buildings here. And it's like, oh, yeah, you know, just just tear this old building down because eh, it's in disrepair. And let's put in, you know, a loft that has this gentrification gray. And I was like. <laughs> but it's 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 a real thing and I, I i think you're you're right too when you're outside and there's that public art that's out there and someone is working on something you know some people may 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 not stop some people will but it is this notion of oh someone is taking interest in this neighborhood there is an attempt to beautify which you know often is is ignored like mm -hmm. these these quote unquote um urban settings if the inverted commas what have you that's where that type of stuff like the, the the public art the murals and things of that nature happen a lot and it's like if this art is important because people will say it is why isn't it in these places that these kind of touristy places or what is the quality of art in these touristy places right and, but I, I think i think that leads to this next really long question so bear with me um indulge me here I, I I like that your bio stays pre-gentrified Lower East Side of Manhattan, and I think it's an important distinction to make. Um, new folks learn about a place or scene will think, oh, it's always been this way. Hey, it's always been clean. I've always had so much art here. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's always been like less sketchy or whatever the term is people throw around. And they don't realize that cultural shift, the history, the gentrification. Could you share with us the importance of making that sort of distinction and perhaps where and how that maybe informs like your work? And how long have you you've been in Baltimore and have you noticed those shifts here? Mm hmm. Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. Um, there's so many layers there. Um, and thank you for naming that you know, the intentionality around like the color scapes around um, gentrification and how colors are strategically utilized um, for all of the things we know happen. Um, yeah, I say pre-gentrified because I find that what happens is um, because gentrification is a byproduct of colonialism, mm -hmm. um, a huge part of colonization is erasure. Um, erasing your history, where you come from, um, your traditions, your legacy, everything, um, and replacing it with like Eurocentric ideology, et cetera. Um, and I see that that happens also with gentrification, um, given that it's an evolved, more modern, right? Like form of uh, colonization where you're expelling people of color, pri primarily um, black, Latinx um, and AAPI folks, mm -hmm. um, indigenous folks, et cetera. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to, um, sorry, I sort of lost my thought. I'm gonna catch it. Yes. So going back to like why I say pre-gentrified is because I don't want to lose um, where I come from. You know, the Lower East Side right now is one of the trendiest places in the U.S. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I see the same things happening in D.C., um, in Oakland, in New Orleans, um, you know, everywhere, really. And um, there's so much rich history that uh, folks in these areas have contributed specifically to our country. You think about Harlem alone um, as a cultural mecca of this country, of the world, um, and how those stories can quickly become erased um, when new people move in. Um, so I just wanted to name it because I want that to be centered and just always a reminder that there was something here before what folks see now. Um, and then also I do think it's a class marker, right? Like mm -hmm. folks might be like, oh, wow, like you're from LES. Oh, 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 excuse me. Like, what do your parents do? You know, it's like, no, uh, my parent, my mom worked at a sweatshop and my dad, you know, did everything, uh, probably all the things you're not even thinking of. So I think it's also important not to forget um, where you come from. So going back to Baltimore, it's something I struggle with now um, as someone who, you know, quote unquote, has made it, whatever that means. Like I work at a nonprofit, I'm okay now. Like I, I can get Get my needs met. Um, so, you know, coming to leaving New York 
it's tough to be in a place where I see the same things happening here, um, whether it's in D.C. or in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, so I often think about, you know, gentrification doesn't have to be white folks. It's also very much class related. Mm -hmm. um, and and it just because I'm here and I'm Dominican, it doesn't mean that someone else who's Dominican and doesn't have the resources I have might not be able to live here in 10 years, you know. Um, so I do see it happening here and I, I'd like to expand the conversation of gentrification happening even amongst our own communities and like what does that mean and how can we better show up to like ensure that we're building community instead of excluding people who created the conditions for us to even move in so you gave me a long question i gave you a long answer so obviously you might have to edit that down a bit but um yeah i could go a million and one ways with this um <laughs> no, yeah it all stays it because it, it's it's i think I try to in, in the whole process for me, I try to keep the conversation unless someone was like, yo, I sounded crazy right there. <laughs> and I'm like, you did. No, but I, I think <laughs> not. But I think it's, it's an honest thing and it at least provokes the the question, the discourse and the acknowledgement of these these things are happening. And when you're in the know, specifically here in Baltimore, you see these things. If you're in the city, you see things that are happening. You see these commitments to whatever uh, uh, disenfranchised, underrepresented group that may be sitting there. And it's like, yeah, you know, we've always had a rich history of this. It's like, yeah, but you had you had sweatshops. You said this on your. All right, cool. I remember two years ago, it wasn't always this. And but now we are so aware and so so woke towards it because it's now looked at like a, a stream of income and that that feels weird to me and mm -hmm. um it, it it's happening i think to the degree because there is a tension here despite the people that live here being told oh yeah baltimore is blighted baltimore is scary blah 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 i've been saying it for years if it's as dangerous as people presented it and not to say that it's not how are you building so many residential properties in the city? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How are you giving more space for people to live and move into? So like that just seems like it runs counter. Like mm -hmm. it's hard to have a blue light or, you know, whatever those signals are of like danger and so on. And then it's like, oh yeah, this house is $200,000, $300,000, $400,000. Those two things okay. seem like they're, they're opposites. Yeah, absolutely. There's some dissonance there for sure. And it's like the lack of accountability for why it is the way it is, mm -hmm. is really maddening. And like, for me, I like to talk about how hurtful it is. Um, it's hurtful to me to know that in New York City, they could have invested in fixing our playgrounds. Mm -hmm. You know, they could have done a lot. And now they are. So they could have done this the whole time. They just didn't see me and my community as worth investing in. Mm -hmm. And that is why we lived the way we did. Yeah. It's not because we weren't working. It's not because we weren't contributing. It's not because, you know, like <laughs> you can do but so much. You cannot fix the roads. You cannot invest in your schools. You know, like at a certain point, it, there has to be a commitment from the city itself yeah. to cease over investing in certain communities at the expense of others. Um, and, you know, to your point around public art, I will say that uh, my experience, I was doing a mural at Columbia Heights in D.C., rapidly gentrifying Latinx. Um, neighborhood uh, predominantly and you know there was a lot of concern from the residents why is this happening now mm -hmm. why do you care now that because the whole point of it was to slow down cars because that's an intersection where there are a lot of accidents and that's been happening for decades but now they're doing something about it and what signal does that send to people that the city cares when wealthier white people move in and for decades, them feeling unsafe crossing that intersection didn't matter to anyone. Um, there was no action taken. So, you know, there's it's very hurtful, honestly, um, in terms of like what that does to your sense of self and your self-worth and just your mental health um, to be disregarded in such blatant ways. Yeah. And I'll, I'll leave it with this um, before going into the next question. Um, it's one of the things I paid kind of some attention to was um, if we're looking at, you know, 
popular culture consent decree. We own the city and all of that. We're looking at five to six years, maybe seven, I think, um, you know, post like Freddie Gray and some of that attention there. And I remember outside of Baltimore, people were having a lot of comments about Baltimore. It's like, I can't believe they're burning down their own cities and so on. It's like, yo, some of those pictures, nobody touched those, those neighborhoods. Some of mm -hmm. those pictures are of properties that haven't been touched since like 68. And wow. I, just, I just remember my dad was like, yo, that house still looks like that. He's like, nobody burnt that down. That's been burned down. So wow. it's like we're leaving these things untouched. But then we have a commitment once the price goes down to kind of come in and reshape it. And yes, it's hurtful. And yes, it's a um, I think it's a, a rebranding of class in a way and of culture in a way that isn't as indicative of uh, what's here. It, we have a city that's made up of nearly 70 percent black folk. But when you start looking at who's responsible for the branding here and who's responsible for marketing Baltimore as a cultural place, as a cultural beacon, mm, I don't know if that's always as represented and mm -hmm. always represented right. Mm -hmm. You're so right about that. Um, I'm literally covered in chills. <laughs> and then it's like, what do you say when folks know and see that too? Yeah. Yeah. I've been struggling with that in public health because I've been, I, my day job is doing health equity work hmm. uh, for like health departments and such. And at, at some point, my ask is always like, so you know what the issues are and you know how you're contributing? How can we get you to then do something? You know? <laughs> Well, I just don't know if yeah. we have that line item at this. It's like, ah, so back to money. Got it. I thought it was about right. change and, you know, Yeah, impact. like, like, let's see the 70% represented in what you're saying, like directing the cultural impact and uh -huh. the narrative of Baltimore as a Black city. Um, so, yes, yes to all of that. So I got a few more real questions. Uh, so let's see, let's see. Uh, <laughs> so how do you embrace your strangeness that's that's one i'm always interested in like you know strange strangeness being weird being awkward all of those things at one point i feel like people would not describe themselves as that and then there was this shift of i'm odd and it's like that's not real that's inauthentically odd so when you're 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 describing your 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 work and you know it has to be i think we put ourselves into our work so you know there has to be some strangeness some awkwardness there how do you embrace your strangeness when it comes to your work and like qualities that make you unique to your work and to your your field yeah. rather yeah uh, one of my closest friends um alexis bianca alexis she has a uh jewelry store called all things the alexis and she has a sweater too i wish i had a i had it with me but it says um be awkward and i wear it and i almost wear it as like a warning label or just like as a fyi you know <laughs> it's super helpful to just let people know up front like you know what when you go through things in life you're gonna have some weird like things you know or seemingly odd or whatever we label it but it's sort of like you know i think it's just who i am i'm i'm hella awkward i have my social skills could use a lot of improvement at times and yeah i think that that's also you know honestly i know so many visual artists I don't, artists of all mediums who are like that too i think it takes a very sort of introspective person in general um to dig deep and create things mm -hmm. um which can lead to sort of like difficulties interacting with humans um at least in my experience <laughs> um so i guess the easiest way to embrace it is unfortunately i can't get away from it um i wish i could honestly it would make life so much easier um but yeah do you consider yourself a fellow awkward yeah. and weirdo. <laughs> weird, weird as hell. It's like, uh, what are we doing? Here? I'm not doing this. And I, I, I think because I'm an iconoclast in some ways and I, like people usually tell me where I fit and I'm like, sure, I guess if that's what you're saying. And, um, and sometimes it's like hard to embrace it, but no, like I've been podcasting for like 13 years and just the notion that I've been doing it that long and some of the things I used to hear is like, huh, you're just in your mom's basement, just like recording on tapes. It's like, I am and eating pizza and it just, it's great. You know, just mildew and pepperoni. It's wonderful. 
I love that. You're like an actual icon, one of the trailblazers, <laughs> doing podcasts before most people knew what they were. Yes. That's yes. amazing. <laughs> it's, it's a very hipster thing to say, like, yeah, I was doing this before y'all came along and it became okay. an industry. Who, Ira Glass, who? Like, <laughs> <laughs> It's like one of those like jazz musicians that never made any bread, bread or what have you. It's like you young artist, man. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the last real question I got. Um, how do you refill your cup? I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot that's out there. Um, and you know, right now we're in a, we're in a retrograde as we're we're doing this interview and just being able to do your stuff, like stuff that may not be related directly to your work, but it enables you to be in a spot to do your work. It may be the day job. It may be um, interacting with folks and actually doing the artist that cathartic thing, but the stuff that leads into having the time and the space and the capacity for doing your art may be taken away from that. So how do you re refill your cup? Yeah, you know, the last few years have been a struggle as it has been for so many of us, just feeling super drained um, with all the things. Um, so I'm actually really excited to share that on June 1st, um, I'm leaving my job. Um, I'm joining the great resignation um, to go on at least a year long sabbatical um, because my day job, you know, I've been doing um, nonprofit work. I'm a social worker. Um, who has done public health work for about 17 years now. Um, and I'm just really tired, you know, and I found that I was too drained to feel creative. And um, mm -hmm. part of my success with equity work in the public health sphere is my creativity. So I feel like if I don't have time to nurture, you know, my visual art, it does impact my ability to be creative when transforming systems that for so long have harmed us into systems that are working for us and keeping us healthy instead of keeping us unwell. Um, so I just made a choice to like, you know what, this next year is really going to be, I'm going to be my most important client. I'm going to parent myself, make sure I'm eating well, make sure I'm going to bed on time, make sure I'm flossing, you know, doing my face masks or whatever. Um, and really focusing on my art um, because I never really got a chance to do it full time. Um, so yeah, we'll see what comes from it. Um, I think that this conversation is very aligned given the timing and it's giving me a teaser as to like what my life will look like uh, and what my schedule will look like um, in just a couple of weeks. So yeah, I thank you for helping me fill my cup and just giving me an example of like what is going to continue to happen when I center my other passions. That's thank you. That's that's wonderful. And um, yeah, that's, that's great to hear. I got to it's just it's been all teeth on this side of the camera. I, I don't like that. I'm just going to do this for the rest of the time. Just going to cover my mouth. Um, so that's that's the end of the real question. So now it's time to get get weird. Um, it's time for some rapid fire questions. Ew. So with the rapid fire questions, uh, try to answer these as quickly as possible. Whatever pops in your head. Uh, don't overthink it. OK. All right. I'm going to start off with this one. This is this is an easy one, I think. Childhood nickname. It's Rosie, actually. My That's name is Rosaline, my full government. So Rosie, uh, for the most part. Some people call me Roro. Hi, Roro. <laughs> <laughs> It, see, that's, that's the thing. Parents sometimes, however you get these nicknames, it's kind of weird. Like, my my name is Robert, but it's like, yeah, you're Rob. That's your nickname. It's like, not a lot of work was done there, was it? Just No, yeah, same here. Madison <laughs> Avenue was not involved. It's like, oh, yeah, he brought in the best marketers, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, if, if you could have dinner with three artists, whom would you choose? What would you have as well? Oh, I would have like an abundance of the ripest, most in season fruits. So like mangoes, pineapples, papayas, watermelon, just the sweetest peaches you could ever think of. And uh, maybe some wine. And I would invite Keith Herring, Frida Kahlo. Um, and could the third person be anyone? Yeah, sure. Okay. I have to do better. At remember this, remembering this person's name, um, but they are an Asian artist who does a lot of dot, dot work. Um, do you know who they are? Hmm. Hmm. Not sure. Okay. I'm trying to Google it really quickly. Um, shoot. I think it's Yumi Sukugawa. Okay. That's, that's, great. that's a great pronunciation right there. 
Hopefully, um, somebody drag me um, if you're listening to this and I got all of this wrong. Uh, my apologies. I'll do better next time. <laughs> it's like, yeah, Rosie's trash. Get out of there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um thank you <laughs> no, that's that's good that's good um let's see uh t- what is a terrible movie that you love oh my god there's so many um <laughs> probably i'll just go from the first movie i saw in the theater teenage mutant and ninja turtles <laughs> hey language i did a review on that one before, recently really i do movie reviews yeah okay we're, so we're, it's not so it's an it's an it's a work of art is what i'm hearing <laughs> so it's, no, it's a bad movie however okay <laughs> i was five when it came out so <laughs> i know i mean the magic was there it was based in new york city they were eating pizza they were yeah what else do you need <laughs> I, I just remember when i was watching it upon being like in my 30s now watching it, i was like huh New York's a city that doesn't sleep. A lot of a lot of empty streets in New York in the nineties. Huh, kind of clean yeah. too. This is a set. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, two more. Um, do you prefer social time or alone time? And I think I know the alone answer. Alone time, such an easy. I'm such an introvert to a point where it sometimes scares me. Like, <laughs> how about you? Are you going to answer any of these or no? Probably uh, I mean, not. if you want me to answer, I can. I mean, this one in particular. I. I prefer social time, but small groups. Okay. I love yeah. that. Yeah. It's yes. got it got to be small. Like if it's too many people, like I've gone to some openings recently and I'm like, all right, it's too many people here. I'm going to be here 10 minutes. Yeah. yeah. That's such a good answer. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an honest answer. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer the other ones then. Cause it makes, why not? Um, childhood nickname junior. I was the extent. Cute. Oh, I love that. <laughs> but I'm like the biggest person in my family and extended family. So it's almost like, <laughs> hi, baby Huey. Uh, let's see. Um, three artists. Um, hmm. I, it would probably be sushi that would have, you know, the, the food with like big sushi, like to the whole yeah. game. Uh, but like Japan sushi, not like mid sushi here. Um, we've got to be Questlove. He and I share a birthday. So, oh, so that would be one. Okay. Probably Basquiat, because, uh, you know, just and yes. um, Roy Lichtenstein, that would be the other. Yeah, we're gonna have a great conversation. And that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, um, it's going to be ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wow, these these two guys are just sitting here playing drums and just like talking on a mic. like, huh, just drumming to a podcast, I say. Um, movie. Uh, probably Scarface. Scarface is not a good movie. No, it's not. Yeah. The accent is so bad. Um, but it's, it's a classic. Oh, it, it is a classic. I mean, if you're over a certain <laughs> age, you've had a poster in your room of noted Italian American actor playing a Cuban actor. You can't play Absolutely. a Cuban drug lord or what have you. Uh, and uh, so lastly, this is the, uh, the last one. Um, odd habit or superstition. Oh, I definitely knock on wood. And what else do I do? That's kind of like an odd habit um, slash superstition. Probably that would be the biggest one. Knocking on wood. If like somebody says something that I don't want to happen to me. Uh- <laughs> that's, that's about right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I, I have an odd habit of uh, giving myself new nicknames. Like it's a list and it's getting longer and longer. Uh, Skirt Angle is on there. Charles Lingus is on there, which they get more inappropriate as they go down the list. Uh, Wave Daddy, I have a jersey that says that, which, because, you know, of course, uh, I, I'm going to stop right there, actually. Do you, get like, try them on for a while? I like do. Like, to be like, okay, I'm a, this is my nickname for, like, a month or two. I'm really into puns, so it's just naturally there. Like, I'm not a dad, but I live a life of dad jokes. Yes. You know what? I There's a growing number of um, dad vibey people in my life who are not dads. <laughs> <laughs> well, that being said, it's, it's past curfew. That being said, uh, I want to thank you for being on this podcast. And uh, two, I want to invite and encourage you to tell the fine folks where to check you out, anything that we've missed in this conversation. Um, now the floor is yours. Plug away. 
Yes, thank you so much for having me. It's so wonderful to meet you um, and talk to you. You can find me on Instagram uh, at rosy.sunshine and that's R-O-S-Y or rosysunshinepaints.com. Um, I'm on TikTok, but I don't remember the handle and I haven't posted too much yet. Um, but yeah, it's been such a pleasure connecting with you. I'm definitely going to hit you up after. Um, yeah, so we can nerd out some more for sure. This has been great. So I'll, I'll do my wrap up here. Uh, so for the for the great Rosie Galvan, I am Rob Lee saying that there's art in and around Baltimore. You just got to look for it.